Let me read that again. So if you're willing to bleed a little bit every day, but in exchange, you'll win big later, you will do better. Think of when I think of that, I think of the opportunity cost. I think of the the social cost of uh, and 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 the the discipline of eliminating FOMO. This is Better Wealth with Caleb Williams. Warren Buffett is sitting on over $145 billion, billion with a B, of cash and short-term investments. In this episode, I'm going to be talking about the golden rule, what Warren Buffett and this guy named Naval, who's brilliant, and I love his, um, love his philosophy, how they, what they all have in common and how you can take this as an entrepreneur, as an investor, and really become uh, more wealthy and more successful. So Warren Buffett, obviously the icon person to watch in the market and has created a ton of wealth and, and has credited this wealth from uh, this idea of compounding. He's obsessed with compounding. He's obsessed with opportunity costs. He's obsessed with not losing money. It's very interesting because um, some of you uh, are, give me a call or are talking to our team and you're freaking out because there's so much opportunity out there and your money's sitting and you, you want to maximize it. You want to like take loans against your life insurance or, you know, take money out of cash or liquidate your mutual funds to go do certain things. And sometimes you hear, if you talk to me personally, you hear just me like, let's like, let's hit the brakes, let's hit the brakes. And I want to note that this message, this video, this podcast is not for the typical uh, employee, the typical person. If you're typical and your, your whole game plan is invest in mutual funds, dollar cost average, do your thing 20, 30, 40 years, go for it. We can have, I've had plenty of episodes on why I think that could be a flawed strategy, but for the typical person, that might be the best thing. So go for it. But this is for the person that has specialized knowledge, that is an entrepreneur, and that values control. And I think it's very interesting what, what we can learn from Warren Buffett and Naval, Golden Rule, and some other things. And so here's what I, here's what I want to say. When I, when I say the Golden Rule, majority of people think of you know, do unto others the way that you want to be treated. It's like treat others the way that you want to be treated. It's this, it's this thing that we've been taught growing up. Well, I have to give credit to Nelson Nash and um, his book, Becoming Your Own Banker. And he talks about the power of banks and controlling money. But he talks about the golden rule are those who have the gold make the rules. Let me say that again. Those who have the gold make the rules. Think about the wealthy people, the people of influence, people that are making things happen. How did they get wealthy? Was it because they dollar cost average their money over 10, 20, 30, 40 years? Or did they have control over their time? Did they have influence over people? Did they have access to capital to say yes to an opportunity that, that changed their life? And, and it's, it's interesting because, again, we value a lot, a lot of times the typical advice is, you know, do, be invested or we're very entrepreneurial and we have the fear of missing out and we're like jumping into another opportunity because it's like we don't want to miss out. We don't want to miss out on this once in a lifetime opportunity. Um, and so we just we we jump in and and in a lot of times when everything hits the fan, we're, we're tied up, our money's tied up. And and the people that are really making the wealth are the ones that have capital that buy you know houses at a discount, stocks at a discount, businesses at a discount, hire people. That might be that might be willing to work for a discount, and and it's and it's it's very interesting. I actually I'm going to share another example. Um, we're producing a movie, and the movie producer that I am working with, Jason Rank, he he like he was super busy, and then this thing called COVID hit, and um it it hit. It was you know awful. There's a lot of jobs that fell through for him because who wants to like do film and events and all this stuff? And so we got to work a deal. And and I would say I got a I got a great deal on on an asset that's going to be tremendous value for our, our business. That's an example. That's a I guess a minor example of I had access to capital. I had the golden rule working for me, and I got to to say yes. And it was a true win win for all parties. But at the end of the day, um, if it was an amazing economy and there's the the demand from everybody and everyone had access to capital, I don't think we'd be doing the movie with Jason. Um, but that wasn't the case. And so that that's just a that's just one example of having access to capital. So what's interesting is Warren Buffett was, and I, and I got this article from Market Watch, and we'll put the, the link of the article in the description below, but he's at his you know, annual 
stockholder uh, shareholder conference. And he's talking about, you know, obviously Buffett and I'm quoting him and said uh, that the pol that the Federal Reserve and the stimulus package passed by Congress have done a tremendous job of propping up the economy. It's interesting that he used the word propping up, the propping up the economy and interest rates remain low. Um, and he uh, he pointed out that the government clearly learned lessons from the Great Recession in 2008 and acted quickly. But he pointed out that it's hard to know what's going to be happened to the long term consequences of these policies, i.e., printing trillions of dollars, like how that's actually going to affect how inflation is going to affect the economy and uh, and interest rates. And I could do a whole rant that I will spare you guys. I could do a whole rant on how interest rates affect stocks, you know, how they affect housing prices, how they affect so many more things than we think. It's like we think all these things just appreciate, but it could be that our money is getting less valuable. And as a result, these things are staying its value, but because interest rates drop, um, we think they appreciate. And so it's just interesting that they're at an all-time low. What does that mean? What does that mean long-term for um, our existence and our wealth? And so he goes on to saying, you know, Buffett said he did not regret selling off Berkshire's $6 billion stake in the ma major airlines last year, even though those, uh, those stocks have grown significantly since he sold them. Buffett also said, and this is something that we don't really have on our side, but and we, we can't really relate to this next statement, but he, he said, um, that he thinks airlines might not have gotten uh, able to secure as much of the government aid if they've had uh, in the pandemic, if they had that very uh, rich major stakeholder like us, which is interesting when you're a Berkshire, you're, you can make massive swings. I mean, $145 billion is a lot of money. He then says, you know, then, then this article says that the Omaha, Nebraska based Berkshire is sitting on over 145.4 billion in cash and short term investments because Buffett has struggled to find major acquisitions for companies for several years. Um, and he just, and he points out later that there's, there's just a lot of, it's, it's hard for them to find things that are tr true value creation, like value offers. And so what they're doing is they're just sitting on cash and Warren's a pretty smart person. He has to report all, ultimately to the people and his investors, but they wanna be able to make moves and they don't want to just buy into the FOMO. And it's just very interesting to be like, okay, Warren, again, he he might be credited too much, but he's he's been successful. For him to sit on this much cash and for him to not jump on other opportunities, it's interesting. I'm not saying he's right. I'm saying it's interesting. And I don't think 20 years from now, he's in the same position. Like I I don't I see this these couple years of, of Warren Buffett sitting on cash, I think is an um, indication that there's going to be money to be made because he's going to be one of a few people that if something hits the fan, if something changed, if there's a massive opportunity, Warren could 10x, 100x his wealth by having access to capital and saying yes. And when everyone's, you know, you know, greedy, run, but when everyone's scared, when there's blood on the street, buy. That's that's his, you know, in, investment theory 101. And another another thing that he's known for saying is, you know, buy low sell high. Everything's super high right now. That doesn't mean you shouldn't buy a house. That doesn't mean you shouldn't invest. That doesn't mean you shouldn't invest in Bitcoin. Point is, don't get caught up in the FOMO. So I think that's that's interesting. And I just want you to, I want that to sink in. Again, this is this this podcast, this YouTube is not investment advice. Do not sue me. Don't say that Caleb told me to sit on cash and not invest. But I'm telling you, I'm telling you, it, the, the successful people have a cadence of patience. And and they and they're willing to stay back and be patient and take advantage of a um, a great opportunity instead of just a good opportunity. And because they have access to capital, i.e., the golden rule, it's able to show up powerfully in their future. I want to break down uh, something by a guy named Naval, and this guy has done a Twitter. He he's known for like his his tweet rants uh, and tweet storms, and talks a lot about how to become wealthy and how to be rich. He's made a lot of money in investing in startups, and I just really, really appreciate how he thinks. He talks a ton about leverage, and you can see, like, I just want you to know how much I appreciate Naval's work. All of his stuff is free online. Um, I, I bought his book, but you can listen to his podcast for free. You can, you can actually get the digital copy of his book for free, and all of his thoughts are on Twitter as well. But he he had he had this thing that when I was you know listening to it I was like that's so good and that's just one of the reasons I got his book and I'm gonna read it to you, 
um, he, he talk, he's, he's talking about wealth and all these things. And he makes the statement that says, if you're willing to bleed a little every day, you may win big later. I want this to sink in. Think of Warren Buffett. Think of the golden rule. So later in, he says, whereas most people want to make a little bits of money every day in exchange, um, they'll tolerate lots of uh, blow up risks. They'll tolerate going um, completely bankrupt. So, so what, what he's essentially saying is a lot of people are you know, willing to take on a, quite a bit of risk for tying up their money into something. He then goes on to say, and by the way, I'll, I'll put this in the description below the link. Um, he says, um, we're not evolved to bleed a little bit every day. If you're out of your natural environment and you get a cut you're liter and you're literally bleeding every day, you'll eventually die. You have to stop the cut. He then goes on to say, we're evolved for small victories all the time, but that becomes very expensive. Think about this. It becomes very expensive. That's where the crowd is. That's where the herd is. So if you're willing to bleed a little bit every day for exchange, you'll win bigger later you will do better. Let me read that again. So if you're willing to bleed a little bit every day, but in exchange, you'll win big later, you will do better. Think of, when I think of that, I think of the opportunity cost. I think of the, the social cost of, uh, and, and, and the, the discipline of eliminating FOMO. I'm not saying never take action. I'm saying that that last statement of if you're willing uh, to bleed a little bit every day in exchange to win bigger later, you will do better. He and then he further he he furthermore says that is by the way entrepreneur entrepreneurship entrepreneurs bleed every day. They're not they're not uh, making uh, money. So the, yeah, then he says they're not making money. They're losing money. They're constantly stressed out. All the responsibility is upon them. But when they win, they win big. On average, they'll make more. So. In conclusion, I, I want to wrap this all up, uh, and it, it's interesting because three years ago I was driving in the car. We, you know, Better Wealth is getting going, and you know, I was, you know, listening to a podcast. I can't even tell you who the podcast was on, but it was with this younger guy that made a ton of money investing in opportunities, and he was just he was just asked about his investment advice, and he he said a statement. He said a lot of people are putting their money, they're investing in their their uh, they're investing in investments, whatever, but they don't have any sizable money to make a difference and say yes to something that could change their life. And he's like, my philosophy, this is what he said, my philosophy is just keep cash. And if I'm going to say yes to an investment, that investment better have, um, have a higher probability than gambling, a, 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 pro a higher probability to change my life. And if it doesn't have a change your life status, I'm just not gonna invest. Now, I think you gotta be careful because you could just be sitting all day long on just, and never take action. But during 2008, if you had access to capital and you were able to say yes to certain things, it didn't really matter what, right? You could say yes to the market. You could say yes to um, housing prices. You could say yes to a lot of things. There's a lot of wealthy people that made their wealth in 2008. Because unlike how we think about money just evaporating. Like we think like 2008 was horrible for everybody. Like the money just evaporated out of skin, uh, thin air. No, that money got transferred to other people's pockets. That money didn't evaporate. That money got transferred to other people's pockets. And that's interesting because a lot of people lost money, but the people that won, won massively. So I'm not saying Warren Buffett is right on this. I think it's very interesting that he's sitting on billions of dollars of worth of cash um and i i think it's interesting that you know he's 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 waiting and he doesn't feel comfortable to just jump in i think naval in his idea of you know you know we are not conditioned to want to bleed every day but the person that can potentially bleed every day and i i see that as maybe missing out on your 8 10 20 30 percent of interest that you could be earning like we're not conditioned to do that but if we do the golden rule, those who have the gold make the rules. Do we have the ability to do that? This idea of opportunity fund, are we going to be able to invest in opportunities? And just the example is, are we positioned in something that we can literally change our life? So I know this is what was a unique podcast, uh, but again, I, I'm, making this, I'm making this as a, a legacy piece because I have a funny feeling that I'm going to reference this podcast back 
five, 10, 15 years because I everything's cyclical. And I just think that this is a principle that you can live your life. It's not just on the economic markets. It's very much on on a lot of things. So with that, thank you. If you're watching on YouTube. I appreciate you. We're trying to grow our channel. Please share this with someone that needs to hear this message. And I appreciate all of the Better Wealth family that, that tunes in around the world uh, to live more intentional and to really get their money as a tool to unlock that. Thank you so much for listening to the Better Wealth Podcast. It would mean the world to me if you could hit subscribe, leave a review, and share this with the people that you know and love.